Twitter ita hola ndipiko hama zangu muri ya Zimbabwe tino mkamicho ya mchogu wa chelo chelo chiki ushelo di connection le lami o Mike Wove what's good what's good what's good Zimbabwe muse welcome to the connection a studio servant's very own youth program that targets tackling anything and everything youth related this program that you tuned into right now is the connection I brought to you uh, by studio servant voice of America on Tuesday the 18th of October 2020 muri ya Zimbabwe mtagazo muse I'm your host uh, Mike Wove First order of business, Muria Zimbabwe, unfortunately, Tina Urombo, Silu Sizing and Bella. Due to COVID-19, we're working from home, so unfortunately, this is a pre-recorded program. What this means is you cannot call in as per usual, and of course, this program is not live. I, but you can still send your comments up on WhatsApp up a number 02 plus one two zero two four six five zero three one eight, or you can tune into our video broadcast and leave your comments in the comment section on of three Facebook pages of VOA Shona, VOA Debele, and VOA Studio Seven. Just name Muria Zimbabwe, Tinipa, no Sisonke, like so. Pano Pachirongo Chedichevich, Iki, Oshelo, the connection, Lilami, or Mike Wobe. Tonight on the connection, we continue the discussion on COVID 19. However, focus is going to be placed on women and the girl child. The conversation isn't going to end there. We're also going to touch on our issues with regards to women empowerment. And then, of course, we're going to be highlighting uh, what's happening in our schools. Week three, teachers are still protesting. So we're going to figure out, you know, we're going to. We're going to try to highlight what exactly is happening in the schools. First up, health, Chiroreche coronavirus, Mkushani with COVID-19. Now, according to John Hopkins University, over 37,860,000 people worldwide have contracted coronavirus. Over 1,081,000 people have died. And some positivity, over 26,321,000 people have recovered worldwide. Now, according to the most recent tweet issued by the Ministry of Health, Zimbabwe currently has over 8,000 COVID cases. The de uh, death toll currently is at 230, and over 7,620 have recovered. Now, the latest information released by the Ministry of health of course does not show the cumulative amount of our uh, pcr tests conducted to date however they do highlight that 481 pcr tests have been were conducted yesterday alone 10 cases tested positive and a beautiful discovery one thing they've managed to highlight in the data released yesterday 1122 people have recovered from covid 19 with zero deaths now that means that the country currently has 164 uh, active coronavirus cases. So that's some good news over there. Now, Muria Zimbabwe, before we delve deeper and speak to our health experts as to how coronavirus has affected women and the girl child, let's head over to the uh, COVID task force, the interministerial task force uh, set up by President Emerson Mnangagwa. Yesterday, they toured RGM, Robert Caprio Mkabe International Airport, uh, to kind of see if the international airport is ready to facilitate both local and international flights uh, as the country slowly eases its uh, lockdown restrictions. Let's head over to the Interministerial Task Force. I uh, hear the next clip you're about to see is courtesy of the Ministry of uh, Information on their Twitter page. You're about to hear from the Minister of Information, Honorable Monica Mchangwa, who's going to brief us a little more about what's happening with the Interministerial Task Force. Let's hear more from her. Uh, because it has actually given us confidence in, as we speak to our public to assure them that, uh, especially those who want to travel both Zimbabwe to want to go outside and those who are coming into the country, that uh, you, your health is uh, number one, is the priority number one. The airport has put all measures to make sure that they continue the spread of that disease. We are also happy that those who come into the country without that COVID-19 free certificate, they have an opportunity to be tested right here at the airport. And that process has been reduced to just two and a half hours, and some are actually saying two hours. I think that is uh, really good news to those who are who are intent to travel to Zimbabwe to say as soon as you get at the airport, there are three companies, three laboratories who have uh, who are all internationally recognized, who will test you and the results will be out in two hours and by that time if you are COVID nineteen free, you then be released home. But if you are positive, then the Ministry of Health will take you to their isolation centers where you will be taken good care of. 
So you're here and there, that's what's happening, Maria Zimbabwe. Just yesterday, the Interministerial Task Force took to RGM International Airport to kind of see, is the International Airport ready to facilitate international and local flights? Uh, you heard there, uh, it seems like it's uh, ready to go. And another thing that Honorable Monica Mchangwa highlights is the fact that for those people who are going to be coming in and do not have their COVID certificates, there's going to be testing done at the uh, in, at RGM International Airport. And what that means is for those that uh, test uh, positive, uh, the Ministry of Health is going to be taking you into the quarantine centers. And for those that test negative, you get to proceed into the nation. So that's what's happening in Zimbabwe, COVID related. That's uh, the latest information released by the government. Now, let's head over to our medical uh, expert, our health expert, Constancia Mawodza. Well, it's a great thing to have information. I'm very big on decision making that's informed by data. So the very fact that we do have information of what the numbers look like is like right. a positive and that's a plus. Right. But more importantly, I think in, in Zimbabwe, we've been having almost like a stabilization of the COVID cases. Mm -hmm. So in this month alone, for example, there's only been one death. I think the highest number of cases we had was like on the 9th of October. I haven't checked the dates over the last three days, but like 32 new cases. So everyone right now is trying to stabilize and adapt to this new normal of living with a virus that we don't have mm -hmm. um, a cure to yet, right? Mm -hmm. So it's almost basically about prevention and management and trying to go back to, to normal lives. So, mm -hmm. so I think in that way, a little bit like most African countries and very different from Europe and America is that we didn't have the very high numbers, at least relative to like Europe and America, right? Like right. They stayed small, relatively speaking. But I think the, the numbers increasing in a country like Zimbabwe really had to do with just how weak our health system is. Mm -hmm. That if the numbers had continued to rise, we have a health system that's struggling and that would not be able to cope with severe disease of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So I think in that way, it's been, in as much as we've had all of these challenges, the idea that our numbers never really went out of control uh, in as much as we panicked and we saw community cases rising, um, yeah, it, it did not end up being like a bomb that, that mm -hmm. burst that because broke. really our health system would not have been able to manage if we'd had really, really high numbers. So, so fingers crossed they stay stable for a bit. Would you say that as a country we've been able to manage it uh, better so far? That's a wild one, right? I think... I think that with other countries, it might not necessarily be about a terrible health system or a struggling health system. Like other factors were coming into place, right? It's governance and leadership. It's decision making and what you choose to prioritize. So the health system might be strong, might be able to absorb. I mean, you can look at New Zealand, right? They did it well. They had a leader who was committed to controlling COVID-19 and they're pretty much back to normal life. Mm -hmm. at this point, whereas other countries are having like a second wave right. of, uh, of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So I think with, um, with other countries and other situations, it wasn't necessarily that the health system is crippled, that if you actually have, you have the finances, you have the technology, you have the resources, you right. have the health, the health right. workforce, but it's really what decisions are you making to use all of those resources to contain and control COVID. So it's a little bit of a difference in the strategies in which people have been using, I guess, like I said, the stats and the information to, um, to deal with the COVID situation. Now let's delve into the reason I really brought you here, the healthcare system mm -hmm. and how it was been disrupted by COVID-19, especially yeah. when we're looking at women. Um, yeah. How would you say COVID-19 disrupted uh, the services that women receive when it comes to healthcare in Zimbabwe? Yeah. Uh, well, first, I'm going to give you a disclaimer, right? Because uh, women's access to healthcare services was already compromised pre-COVID. Okay. So we'll get to that later on. But I think it's very important that we start from that foundation. The same right. way COVID happened, and we were starting from a foundation of a weak health system. Mm -hmm. And that's how we need to view it. And what COVID-19 did about this compromised access to healthcare services for women is that it brought it to the forefront. So it was almost like a magnifying glass right. of things we knew already were existing. And that's what COVID really did, right? So about maybe three or four weeks ago, for example, um, city council clinics were completely shut down. 
And part of it, they were just, I mean, we already have our health workers who are on strike. That's number one. But the second part was just that council didn't have enough PPE to support all mm -hmm. clinics being open. And you would have clinics that are open and they're only open for OI, so for arch right. refills. Right. So if you need anything from STI treatments, from other chronic care, if you needed contraceptives, if you needed um, menstrual health products, if you have a facility that offers that, all of that was no longer easily accessible. And those are like healthcare services that are very woman-centered in that way, right? So all of that was no longer um, easily accessible because your primary healthcare facility, the clinic in your community, if it's closed, you kind of have to figure out or geographically move to to other places and movement wasn't always easy right so we had policing of movement we had military everywhere so if you needed to almost emergently or immediately access health services that wasn't necessarily possible mm -hmm. and then another thing too very early on into the pandemic so of course we all know that the pandemic has been moving very rapidly and the situation right. scenarios all of that has been changing pretty quickly but i remember in the very first week of at least the lockdown in zimbabwe and we had the the country director for Mary Strauss, which is like the family planning uh, organization in Zem. And he was saying that uh, because everyone, when COVID became such a big issue and was basically announced as a pandemic, right? All borders shut down, right? Every country was just like, like no more movement is, right. yeah, is going to happen. But what that happened is we had all of these big organizations whose the entire Zimbabwe national system is dependent on... Um, Population Services Zimbabwe, Mary Strobs, to provide contraceptives. And they had con containers stuck at ports of entry. Oh, right. And those couldn't move, right? Mm -hmm. And we're already existing in a situation in Zimbabwe where we've had a national shortage of contraceptives. It's already hard for young women to get access to contraceptives. Mm -hmm. And now you're trying to access it in an environment where there's a shortage. Mm -hmm. In an environment where you have an entire container that's stuck at a port of entry and you don't know for how long mm -hmm. um, because everyone is like hold on we need to figure out what to do with COVID-19 so those are some of the very like direct ways in which women in which young women were directly impacted um by COVID-19 and they couldn't access the health services they needed when they needed them to now so. another thing I want to touch on because this month seems mm -hmm. uh, this month is more about the girl child so I'm going to get to yeah. how the disruptions are and the girl child are but yeah. you touch on the uh lockdown itself um, mm -hmm. Now that all these lockdown regulations are slowly being eased, um, we mm -hmm. see some open their borders. It's mm -hmm. about slowly easing all these different lockdown regulations. Has this mm -hmm. in terms of the supply uh, for healthcare services? Yeah. So the way that I would approach that, like let's let's approach it from: Has it improved access to health services for young right. women? Right. This easing down of lockdown. Now, if you look at what access is, I'm going to use a framework that I always use when we're looking at access of health services. If you look at, so it's five A's, you have accessibility, which is just geographical location. Can you go to the clinic is like right. the first one. You have availability at the services, the commodities. Can I get my family planning? Is it available, right? That's the second one. You have um, accommodativeness health facility, healthcare service, able to meet your needs, how you how you need them to, right? And then you have affordability. Can I afford to do it, right? right. And then you have acceptability. Do you like the service? It's a quality of service thing, right? Remember earlier on when I said that access to healthcare services already was compromised in them? So what the easing of the lockdown did is maybe it eased some of the A's and not all of them, right? Okay. Now we don't have as much police or military. So yes, I can move from my home to go to the um, to the clinic. So mm -hmm. that was eased in terms of access. But the thing is, if I get to the clinic and there's still no commodities, it's, I, it's not available, right? If I right. get to the clinic and I cannot afford consultation fee plus going to the pharmacy to get my contraceptive, it's not available. It's not right. affordable. Mm -hmm. So it's like... Like I was saying that what COVID did, is that it magnified issues that we already knew we had yeah. in the health system. Yeah. So you almost cannot COVIDize the solution because the problem existed. Was already there. Before, you get it, be, existed before. So it's like, yes, we eased lockdown measures, but the actual root of the problem still exists. Right. And in some ways that needs to still be addressed to improve access to healthcare for, um, for women and for adolescent girls. So now let's delve into the girl child herself. What's her biggest mm -hmm. uh, issue itself when it comes to access to health care in Zimbabwe? And of course, you just highlighted that the issues were there already pre-COVID. So yeah, yeah, yeah. 
people here. <laughs> yeah, that's there are a lot. Uh, divided. So I work with with uh, with young people quite a bit, and I get to interview them and to ask them like barriers to access, what makes you access something, what stops you from from accessing something, and the very kind of big ones that I think are cross cutting. I don't think it's just Zimbabwe. If you do a lot, if you read a lot of the research, a lot of African countries, you kind of um, get those barriers to access. So the first one can go something like um, judgmental providers. I'm a 16 year old who's sexually active and I want contraceptive. And I'm going to my local clinic and the sister in charge is my mother's church best friend, wow. right? So you can imagine how that conversation would have. Why are you having sex at 16? Why are you even coming to ask for, for contraceptives? So all of those issues, like you, t you have young women who will tell you that, you know, I went and I wanted even like treatment for an STI and then the nurse announces it in the entire clinic and it becomes a public conversation. So very little privacy and confidentiality. The idea that you're going to be judged for your sexuality um, becomes a, a big issue. And then just in the Zimbabwean context, the fact that we already were existing within a socioeconomic pandemic before COVID happened, right? I can't afford to buy contraceptives. And now between the national... Um, shortage and the fact that the public sector doesn't have um, commodities, you almost always have to go buy it in the private sector. It's being charged in US dollars and you can't afford it. So it's all of these financial barriers. It's all of these very systemic, cultural, religious barriers that stop young women from accessing services. Even though we know that one in turn, 15 to 19 year old teenagers get pregnant in Zimbabwe. So teenagers are having sex, right? So it's almost like it's on the entire social system, the health system, the decision-making bodies to start working from a foundation of young people are having sex. Mm -hmm. And how do we ensure that we don't end up with unintended pregnancies, unwanted pregnancies, STI infections, all of these other, um, I don't want to say terrible, but consequences of the fact that they are sexually active. And we can do that if we just improved access in certain ways. So now let's get down to the solution. Um, you mm. just highlighted what one of the uh, most important things of this interview. Cannot <laughs> That is the solution. So the problem yes. is not COVID. The problem is for <laughs> COVID. So yes. How, where do we begin to address some of these issues, especially yeah. those that are primarily focusing uh, and affecting the nation's youth? Mm, mm. So, like I said, that I will stick to it. We cannot COVIDize some of these solutions. I'm a very big um, health systems thinker. I very much believe that. Um, we need to think of access to healthcare as addressing the health system, right? And the health system is made up of six pillars of which access to healthcare is just one of them, yeah? So like I was mentioning earlier, it's everything to do from, I don't know if I'll remember all six of them, but let's try, from yeah, like governance <laughs> from Your like governance and leadership, right? Who's the decision maker and are their decisions centered around youth or do they, uh, yes, are we making decisions that are youth centered so that they work for young people in the health system, right? It's something like health finance the Zimbabwean health system is very donor dependent, right? When COVID happened, donors made whatever decisions they needed to make from freezing, from refusing for funds to be repurposed or redirected towards COVID-19. So if you had an entire donor and your entire program was providing sexual and reproductive health to young people and there's a lockdown and the donor, because they also need to figure out how to respond to strategy um, to COVID tells you we need to shut down and stop. It means for like the six weeks, for example, when we were in heavy COVID um, restrictions, you had young people who could not access Absolutely. sexual and reproductive right. health services, right? So with stuff like that, and then it's like the health service delivery, which of course we've already addressed with the um, five accesses issue, the information, research, surveillance, exactly the first question that you asked me, that what's the data that's there and how do you use the, that information and that research to make decisions? So the idea is that you always have to be looking for solutions that are holistically approaching the, the health system. We can't approach it from like a vertical or siloed or disease specific or service specific uh, type of solution. How are we making the health system better? It's our health workforce pay the doctors and nurses, right? Like we have to be approaching all of those six blocks. How are you coming up with solutions for those? So that at the end of the day, we have a more 
resilient is the word for it, health system, right? The next time a pandemic happens, and pandemics are inevitable, we don't know when the next one is coming, but at least you will have a health system that's able to absorb the shock of something like COVID-19 without completely crumbling down, without diverting the entire health workforce so that other healthcare uh, services no longer have people serving it, yeah? Right. So the idea is have a very resilient and robust health system. So regardless of what punches come at it, it's going to be able to still sustain, it's going to be able to still um, ensure that everyone has access to the health services that they need. So my solution would be very much health systems focused and not even necessarily that it's um, quote-unquote youth-focused or quote-unquote sexual and reproductive health-focused. Mm-hmm. Fix the system, and then everything else will flow through that functioning right. system. Right, makes sense. Yeah. Um, as we wrap up our conversation, we mm-hmm. have a lot of young people that are paying attention to you right now. Yeah. Um, a lot of girl childs that are listening <laughs> to you right now, and they're looking for some advice. You being mm. the health experts, what would be yeah. your parting words uh, for these young people that are paying attention to our interview right now? Yeah, so my parting words will be <sighs> inform yourself, right? So unfortunately, the system is not always going to support what you have to offer. It's the example that I was giving, right? That if you went to a healthcare facility and you needed healthcare services and you were met with a provider who's judgmental, who's going to judge you, it's a very different conversation. I'll give you an example. I went to a PSZ clinic once. And the provider was just like, yeah, I'm going to give you this um, contraceptives, et cetera, et cetera. And I was like, no, we need to sit down and you need to walk me through all of the contraceptives you have. What are the side effects? What are the pros and cons? So that I can make an informed decision about which one I take, right? But that's Connie who's empowered and wants the services that she wants and is able to articulate that. And you're not always going to have access to that. So my point of view is it's better to almost have a conversation with your provider where you come and say, oh, I read that this might have side effects. Is it possible if I take on this? Because then you give yourself more agency. You're a little bit more empowered. And that conversation may go a better way, especially if you can only access um, public health sector uh, facilities. So inform yourself as much as possible. Never, ever be afraid to ask questions. There's never a wrong answer. You, you know, the worst that someone can say is no. Mm-hmm. So go for literally self-empowerment. Don't wait for someone to come and empower you and give you information. Look for the information. If you don't trust it, then you can ask who you need to ask. But look for that information so at least you can have conversations with people. And what would you have to say to the young girl who goes looking for uh, contraceptives, healthcare services, and is judged? Which is, ah, what are you doing? You're 16. Why are you sleeping around? Blase, blase, yeah. blase. What would yeah. you say to her? Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's, that's, that's a hard one. So the law is supposed to protect you. So, I mean, it goes back to knowing your information, right? Because you could actually say, I am allowed to access services. I don't need my parents to be here. That, Like, you could say what your rights are, that mm-hmm. kind of thing. So what I would say is um, you are to challenge is the wrong word, but respond back, which goes against everything in our culture. But you are entitled to the health services that you need when you need them, right? The next option, especially if it's public sector, is maybe trying to figure out if they are very youth-centered and youth-centric programs that you might be eligible for, that you might qualify for, and go seek your health services there. Because chances are they are going to be free. Chances are the providers there are trained in youth friendliness, so they know how to engage with you without judging you. Like It's very client-centered and client-focused. So that would be my option, that if you kind of don't know what the law is and what you can access and what your rights are, then my next one would be in your community, is there a health program that's very much centered and caters to youth. And usually with those programs, you have providers who are trained to engage with you, to not judge with you, to not judge you, to not have um, attitudes where you're concerned. 
Stand wonga unko sasa na Constance ya Mawodza chino da kutenda Chora mkana ono kutenda mozare Constance ya Mawodza Na kupinda mchirongwa chedu That was a Constance ya Mawodza Our health expert Anga chibata Anga chibata Achinyato ezea Nyaye kuti Chirwere chi coronavirus Chaka nga nisa sayi upenyu Wevanu kazi Pangwechete nevana skana So ube tinta ngempela utabalolu U Constance ya e Tasisa ngempela Uguti Umkushani lo we COVID-19 Use paza mise njani Impilo e sabe sfazana ganye la namangazana ai amanto bazana elizweni ube tinta e khasisa ngempela ukuthi sikhangela udaba lokuthi e kwa kule shortage ye meat even school manje uyasho ngempela ukuthi ama contraceptives ayahlupha ukutholakala phansi kohlelo lwe lockdown e olu kutaza uzulu ukuthi ahlale ezindlini ba e so ube khasisa ngempela ukuthi enenge labe sfazana babe bhekene nalo ludubo lokuthi they could not access e e e healthcare uh, ngendlela elula um so that's what our uh, constancia was saying e saka ndilo zvanga zvitsana ngurwa na zvare constancia mawodza achinyatso tsana ngurwa kuti kuti e vazhinji vanukadzi nevana skana vanga chisangana nematamutso akati one day uh, the main one being access kune healthcare kune mshonga e wakafanana nema contraceptives ayo anodzivira kuti mwana e ave nelumbu e saka ndilo zvanga chitsana ngura constancia ndio maondro ake a makati rachongo chedu chedu chidiki muri ya zimbabwe ushero the connection ni sakangano vatuwa uchipa wa maondro au plus one two zero two four six five zero three one eight pa whatsapp ndio namba ya kutroera ya kutumira ma message pa whatsapp If you find yourself uchi warao and you think you might be displaying my symptoms into related to coronavirus, 2019 is the number to dial to find out more. Chirongwa the connection mwine ni Michael Hove so far. How has coronavirus affected the girl child Munyeka? But whilst we're still on the same discussion on the women and the girl child and women empowerment early on, I touched on the fact that that's another discussion we're going to have here on the connection. On Sunday, it officially marked the International Day of the Girl Child, a day set aside by the United Nations, which targets towards highlighting strides made worldwide uh, in terms of promoting and empowering the girl child and also reminding people the work that still needs to be done in terms of, uh, once again, promoting and empowering not just the girl child, but women in a whole. So let's head over to a video that we have courtesy of the United Nations, uh, courtesy of the Twitter page of Amina J. Mohammed of the United Nations, whereby she was basically breaking down the importance of such a day and, of course, why it is important uh, to empower the girl child and women in a whole. Let's hear more uh, from uh, Mrs. Mohammed. As we mark the International Day of the Girl this year, I'm happy to see our focus on the diversity of adolescent girls' voices. Adolescent girls are anything but the same. Their diversity is one of their strengths, including geography, ethnicity, race, age and disability. This year, 2020, has been dominated by the COVID-19 pandemic, which has caused unprecedented social and economic disruption. At the same time, global movements are raising their voices against inequality and for social justice. As we look forward to recovering from the pandemic by creating more equal, sustainable and inclusive societies, amplifying and unleashing the strength and power of this generation of 600 million adolescent girls has never been more important. Today's girls are global leaders on issues including the climate crisis, education for all, child marriage, racial injustice and mental health. 
To girl leaders on the front lines and to all girls, I say, be bold in your demands, be confident in the steps that you are taking. Your solutions and ideas are essential to step up the pace of progress. But while there is progress to celebrate, there are also gaps that are holding back millions of adolescent girls around the globe. Two out of three girls of secondary school age are in school today, up one in two in 1998. But in at least 20 countries, hardly any poor rural young woman complete secondary school. And even in middle and higher income countries, only 14% of girls who were top performers in science, technology and mathematics expected to work in those fields compared to 26% of top performing boys. Adding to these gaps, 4 million teenage girls are now at risk of early marriage due to COVID-19, further curtailing their life chances and aspirations. As we celebrate the achievements and potential of girls, we must keep up the pressure for change. The United Nations stands together today with your generation of girls and for a better and a more equal future for all. Thank you. So, Maria Zimbabwe, you're hearing there from uh, Mrs. Amina J. Mohammed of the United Nations. The International Day of the Girl Child, that was this Sunday, whereby she was highlighting uh, the strides that have been uh, made so far, not just in Zimbabwe, but across the whole world, in terms of girl child empowerment, in terms of women empowerment. Now, if you're wondering what's happening, Monique, in Zimbabwe, at this year's 75th uh, uh, ANGA sessions, the United Nations General Assembly, President Emerson Mnangagwa highlighted a couple of strides that the government has made so far in terms of empowering women and, of course, what the Zimbabwean government is doing so far. Now, is that enough? We, uh, I look to hear more from my panelists. But before we head over to the panelists, let us head over to what President Emerson Mnangagwa had to say at the uh, 75th uh, session of the United Nations General Assembly. The next clip you're about to watch uh, is courtesy of the United Nations YouTube page. Let's take it out. Your Excellencies, as we celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Fourth World Conference on Women on 1st October this year, I'm gratified to highlight that Zimbabwe has taken major steps in implementing the Beijing Declaration. These include the adoption of a gender-responsive constitution, establishment of the Zimbabwe Gender Commission, enactment of several pieces of legislation to outlaw all practices that infringe on the rights of women and girls, such as forced and child marriages and discrimination against women in inheritance matters. My government has also set up a women's bank to facilitate access to finance by women on the businesses and the projects. This is Wela Nyembela, Suluganda Babi Tawagazo Mushe, Muria Zimbabwe. You were just hearing there from our President Emerson of Nangakwa, who was highlighting some of the strides that have been made uh, by the Ukulumendo uh, Ake uh, in terms of uh, promoting Abandawa Sakulayo, Abes Fazana, Anjalo, Ama Dombazana. That was our President Emerson Nangakwa. Our President Emerson Nangakwa, our President Emerson Nangakwa, our President Emerson now, to also back up some of the information, what uh, was just uttered, what was uttered by President Emerson Mnangakwa uh, at uh, this year's under session, uh, Sige Sakuma, who Minister of uh, Women and Small to Medium Enterprises, who Mamus Ten Sonyoni, and she touched on uh, two, she highlighted two different things. Um, one of them being that President Mnangagwa's government is working hard to bring equality in, uh, between the girl child and her counterpart, that being the uh, boys. She also touched on some of the laws that are currently uh, being worked on by the government, which is the uh, sexual harassment bill and, of course, uh, the... Uh, gender equality bill which our government is looking to bring into play to ensure that some of these strides that are there look that government is looking to uh, to accomplish uh, comes to play so as is when we see omunye esigesa khuluma nae u sibona ukuhle ubuhlungu 
Owen Sanganiso whispers, what is her thoughts uh, in terms of the International Day of the Girl Child? Jalo utabalo logo tutubiswa, babis fazana, labanto bazana, elizweli. Let's hear what Swanobu Shekutongu of whispers has to say. Uzulu alwa mugele, kodwa aguchipanga, wea zama, uguba wenza galesi ya wona nje, uguba wantu anawa mankazana, sebe zama ugutuola ama tuba. But aguga figi gulapo esi kangelele kona tina jenga wako keli, benza nganizo esi sebenza la wantu anawa nga mankazana. Yewe ye utabala kona lwea ngeniswa, kangani kangani emi sebenzini esi dawini zesi kolo lapa wantu anawa fundela kona. Kodwa aguga figi ewa mugele le ni kakulu kubabantuana la wabanga mankazana batole ama tuba alingana la wesi lisa ngase skangela izi kundla zobu kokele elizweni hachi kwezo mbusa zobu pela kutwa skangela kweza mapizumu usiganyelenda wesi cheneyo bako na na abesifazana abayenele kokele elizweni bako na ye abesifazana asebe ngenile kutwa ab, abagenele ngugusuti sayo Bako na nje uguti la uyatolu kubana ezgaveni ezi nje kukona abe sifazana bako na kutwa inani la kona alihambelani la besi ilisa. Uyatolu kute nguenye la pulewa si ilisa bali chumi uzatolu kula besi fazana kumbe ababili. Uwe neliswa wetu kuma nambazi abe si ilisa la besi fazana. Aguga figi eskaveni esi tavisa yujalo esi chabulisa yu ama kampani ama nengi ama bizimisi ama nengi abaga kali uguta tela uguti la wababonu uguta hai abe sifazana baya konelisa uguti wa kokele kumbe baya nelisa kuba hivo ababele nani eli nengu lula abe silisa sisa silela especially elizwe ndetule zimbabwe uguti sikwanise uguya nanisa inambalelo uguwa kubele representation e hambela nayo pakati kwa abe silisa Kiba ingo kwa yetu sibo, ngogu siche luguti gui ino kumele kwenziwe elizweni ugututugisa abesifazana. Njalo, jenge ntlanga niso elwe la malungelo abesifazana. Lile temba na luguti loku gula kukufeze. Ogumele kwenza gale elizweni uba abesilisa gumele basa mgele tina abantu besifazana. Babone luguti silazo ingo ndo lugu kalipa ugwa nile uguba nasikwanise ugu kokela lugu yenza izi ngumu ezi tutugilisa ama bizimisi kanye lelize tina njenge lunyelo labe sifazana itemba silalu uguwa loku guza fezika nguwa ngasi sebenza labantu anabanga mankazana sugu nge o sugu siyaba kutaza uguwa guluwa gusesi kolu luwa gusema kampani nabu basugu melabu pezulu nga kutuwa gulezi kundla ezi funa ugu tatuwa benye sabi uguwa izi kundla lezi aisizo zabu nyeza abantu besilisa silalu itemba kakulu uguwa emi nyake eni elande layo especially sunga kanye uguwa na ngomi nyaka 2020 Sibe labo abe tu abantuana Aba kwa nisileo ugubusa Ema kampani ni abu Ugu 2019 sibe lai Umtuana oye university Okwa nisileo uti labo Abe ngu president Wama students Goto ena ongo ya sifazana Intuwe nga zaye ENZ So si kubege la pambili Siaba kutaza Bantana wetu wama mankazana Kube kusezi inkini Kube kusuma communities Kube batatele la wapambili Benga meleli Ugupiwa izi kunda Pati ezi nye Basi create labo Kuma communities Kuma business businesses even la sema positions awe kubuswa kwe lize siyaba kutazo kutipa tati ama position o ufunu kwa ngu cancel kwa ngu mp even kwa ngu president tulipa nyaye mwechete yoyo ye vanasikana uyeze vanukazi watupi woka vikana yiku simu zira takabata mshare abiona mataranyika e, mutunga miri kwe sangano re src student representative council Ukoka ku University of Zimbabwe, apiwana matara nyika, jie mwoku tanga, wichikazi, the first female president at the University of Zimbabwe. So I reached out to Abiona so that we could hear her thoughts on the whole discussion around women empowerment and the whole discussion around the empowerment of the girl child in Zimbabwe. Let's hear what Abiona had to say about the matter. Vanaska, na wariku sangana ni matambu ziku akawanda chaizu. Ayo, anusanga ni sirwa, kubatwa kwe shubaro, kushungu rudwa, kuziki sirwa. Ni kungo itwa iho kunge zinu, jisina basa mudzima umu. Ni hamadzavo, kana ni awa wano garana awo. 
uye zvezvakare mwanasikana varusanga nedambudziko rekushaya zvekushandisa apo pawanenge vashika panguva iya yekupera kwemidzi saka tinoti aya matambudziko ari kusangana nevanasikana akati one day and atinoda kuti agone kwa achigadzereswa Sangano re United Nations rinoti zuva iri rakanangana nekurudzira pasi rose kuti vape vanasikana mikana yakaenzana nevana mukomana yekusimudzira nemaondro nyimungati zviri kuitika munyika yeresha ndinoona sekunge zviri kuitika zvishoma nezvishoma asi tichine tichiri nepakasarira apo panoda kugadzereswa izvo tinoona kuti kune vanhu rume nevamwe vanhu vasati vagamuchira pfungwa iyo yekuti mwanasikana anofana kusimudzirwa uye mabasa ake haasingori kuita mabasa emumba nezvekurorwa kana mamwe mabasa aya emudzimba asi anodawo kusimudzirwawo mukurarama umu kuti akwanza chito mamwe mabasa akasiyana siyanawo tichifambirana nenguva kuti mwanasikana anofanirawo kutoenda kubasa achitsvaga mari yake uye achiwana chimwe zvinzvimbo mabasa izvo zvatakangokura zvichinonzi ndezvevarume zvii zvingaitwa kusimudzira vanasikana munyeka ine ndinofunga kuti zvatsingaite kuti tisimudzire vana ava ndezvekuti tichira mbetichiita zvirongwa zvinoita kuti tisimudzire vana vechisikana izvo zvinoitwa nevanhu vakasiyana siyana munyika dzakasiyana siyana uye zvi avo madzimai ava muzvinzvimbo zvikuru zvekuti vanhu vakawanda vanotarisa pavari zvinovakurudziravo kuti vaonekewo vachishandisawo mikana yoya vakawana kuti vasimudzire vamwe vana vechisikana kuti vagone kwa vachidawo kuzvisimudzira uye nekuita zviri nani na upenyu wao E tichitarisa e, mashoko akataurwa nemtungamiriri wenyika va Emerson Mnangagwa Gorerino e, kuchirongwa che United Nations General Assembly e vakabata nyaya yezvirongwa zvakasiyana siyana zviri kuitwa nebazi rinoona nezvekusimudzirwa kwevanhu kadzi e pamwe chete nebhanga re Empowerment Bank nemaondro enyu hurumende Zimbabwe iri kushanda nemazvo mukusimudzira vana sikana pamwe chete nevanhu kadzi tinoda ne zvirongwa zvatiri kumboona zvichiitwa zvekusimudzira madzimai asi sekuona kwangu ndinoti tichiri nebasa guru rekuti tisimudzire madzimai nekuti tikada kutarisa zvematongerwo enyika unoona kuti madzimai mashoma ende zvinhu zvinofanira kugadzereswa kuti tione tichienderera mberi saka ndoti ngatichande nesimba patiru pataita pacho ngati pawedzerei kuti vakadzi vaonekwe vachiwanikwa muzvirongwa izvi semutungamiri wekutanga wechikadzi wesangano rinomirira vadzidzi pachikoro che UZ ndi api mashoko amungada kusiira vanasikana vari kuteerera huru kuredu mashoko anengada kusiira vanasikana vari kuteerera huru kuro yedu mzwara nasi ndive kuti zvona ngati chande ne simba tibvise pfungwa dzekuti vakadzi basa ravo ndere kubika nekugara pamba asi tichande ne simba kuti tioneko tichibuda kunze uko tichitora zvinzvimbo izvo zvakasiyana siyana nekuti munhu wechisikana hapana cha asinga goni saka ngati chande ne simba hapana chinombochikisa hapana chinomboti tadza ngati chande ne simba twani kachiona zvinzvimbo izvi Abiona Madaranyika, the uh, first female president of the United uh, University of Zimbabwe. Uh, she was highlighting her thoughts on the International Day of the Girl Child and, of course, the discussion around women and uh, the uh, empowerment of the girl child in Zimbabwe. And the Ashika, Yokutiwana Skana, Mchishande, Mushande, Nema, Zho, Mkuratiza, Pasiruose, Kutaiwa. Girls can do it too. So those are the thoughts of Abiona Mataranyika. But now, as mentioned throughout this whole discussion by, uh, we heard from Abiona Mataranyika, we heard from Ms. Wonogushe, and also Uesta Zmuzi, women are venturing into different fields uh, of career paths uh, and, you know, encountering different challenges. So I reached out to someone in the arts sector to hear what exactly, what kind of challenges are the girl child, are, are women, are encountering in the art sector. Let's head over to an interview that I had with Samantha Mandive of the uh, Voice uh, to Rep uh, project. She's the project's coordinator. Um, give uh, girl, the girl child having access um, to the opportunities and being made aware of the things that are out there that they're able to be a part of. So yeah, I think recognizing this day is really important, but with it, 
I think that some of the reforms or the policies or some of the things that we can do practically to actually give um, women or girl children platforms in the creative sector are, are equally important. Now, we uh, see the uh, United Nations themselves highlighting that this day is targeted towards highlighting equi equality, um, giving equal mm -hmm. uh, opportunities to the girl child uh, the same way that they do the, uh, I guess, their male counterparts. In your opinion, do you think this is happening, uh, not just in Zimbabwe alone, but across the world? Um, I think I can mostly speak for Zim. Go ahead. Um, um, yeah, I think that it's starting to happen. I don't, I, I can't say that we're quite today yet because as much as there are opportunities that are coming up for the girl child, I think what I'm seeing from my own um, experience is that there's still not equal access. So for example, um, young girls don't have equal access to the internet, um, which are some of the places where they find these opportunities or these things are put up there. Like if there are call outs for, for young girls to participate in, in, in things, it's put on the internet and that equal access is still not there. So which means that the girls don't know what's out there. So yeah, I think we're starting, but I think we have a long way to go. Now you're in the creative space in the art sector. Um, yes. Could you highlight a little more in terms of the challenges that the girl child faces in, uh, especially for those looking to venture into the art sector? Yeah, I think it's, um, it's got a, I, from what I've seen, for example, for a pro the project that I run, um, where we were asking young women to participate in a music competition, and we had about only 16% of women submit applications as opposed to, you know, the men who just like over 50% are submitting. And you find, like I had mentioned earlier, access, they don't have access. So they're not getting all the information, whether it's on radio, on the internet, on television. And also they have a lot more things that hinder them from doing those things, for example, that confidence of feeling like, you know, they're good enough or they're capable of participating in things like that. Um, they have a lot more responsibilities. You find like in countries like Zimbabwe, girls have more responsibilities, whether it's cleaning or cooking or taking care of the siblings. So there's a lot more things that kind of get in the way that hindered them from having that equal access to those same opportunities. Now, uh, when we talk, you've highlighted the challenges, but how then do we fix it to ensure that uh, as per the requirements of the day, there is equality in terms of opportunities for both the girl child and their male counterparts? I think we need to put in a lot more effort in reaching out to young girls. I think we need to go beyond the internet. We need to go beyond radio. I think we need to physically um, reach out to these specific um, communities where we find these girls, whether it's in schools, um, in their homes, and like find ways to access them, where, meet them where they are, you know, and bring them out, basically kind of bring them out into what we are trying to get these young girls to be a part of, um, you know, equip them so that they feel more confident, um, you know, give them access to studio spaces, to equipment, whether they're in the film industry, whether they're painters and artists, they need some, some of these girls, that those basic things they don't have access to. So creating spaces that give these girls access, giving them access to hubs where they can access the internet, um, even things as simple as transportation to get to these places. Um, so yeah, I think, I think it's a lot more of us putting in that extra effort just to give them that access, meeting them where they're at. Right. Now, when it comes to opportunities, um, do, does the girl child in Zimbabwe have an in-depth understanding as to where she can find out more of these opportunities for herself? I don't think she does, honestly. I feel like um, for those that are privileged enough, you know, to be online, again, a lot of these opportunities you find in Zimbabwe are starting to move to the digital space. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of girls the ones that are privileged enough, yes, of course, that have access, but for those that don't, um, yeah, it's just, they just don't have that access. And it's, it's about going beyond the digital world to, to find these girls and, and for them to be aware of what is available and accessible to them. So, Samantha, you are fortunate you're one of the many, I guess, or amongst the few, as you're mentioning, that actually made it into the arts sector and are able to do something for yourself. Yeah. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of uh, young women that are paying attention to our interview right now that are looking for your advice uh, to kind of figure out how best can they navigate and find themselves in a similar space, if not better. Um, what, words of, uh, what parting words would you have for them? 
Um, I would say for me, what really helped was being in spaces that were doing what I wanted to do in the future. For example, um, spaces like creative organizations like Magamba Network, for example, um, the British Council. There's a lot of organizations, not just these big names, but these grassroots organizations, a bus stop TV, that I think that if girls could find a way to be in those spaces, even just as volunteers, you know, I think that really helps to open up the network. Um, once you're kind of in these spaces, that, that was my experience. It's very natural to start to meet the people that um, can help you or to get the ideas or to see how they do it or to learn from them. Um, I think for me, that's what worked. It was just putting myself in these spaces was the best thing that worked and also I think if you can get onto social media get onto Twitter um, get onto Facebook Instagram and follow these organizations in Zimbabwe Kubatana that are always posting opportunities um, yeah there's quite a number of organizations right now in the media space that are always talking about what's happening in Zimbabwe um, just to name a few Kubatana Magamba Network you know organizations like that British Council all right, Maria Zimbabwe, you just heard there from uh, Samantha Mandiwe of uh, Voice uh, to Rep. Uh, she is uh, the project coordinator, touching on the importance of empowering the girl child. Now, Pano Pachonga, early on, I also highlighted Like other African countries, is trying a first reopening of schools after closing in March due to COVID-19. But many teachers like Minaraz Masiwa are refusing to return to class because of low pay and unsafe sanitary conditions. He says he makes more money selling brooms than teaching. Uh, we have got the zeal, we love the kids at school. But only if the government manages to capacitate us, we are under incapacitation situation. Zimbabwe's teachers say they want at least $500 per month and ample personal protective equipment, PPE, against COVID-19. Zimbabwe's cash-strapped government says it has procured $6 million worth of PPEs for schools. And it says teacher salaries about $100 a month, including a $75 COVID-19 allowance, is all it can afford. It is within this context that we are saying to the civil servants, please be realistic, exercise, you know, moderation in the, in the manner in which you def demand uh, salary increases. We don't want salary increases that will upset the stability that we have uh, so far realized. Without teachers in class, Zimbabwe school children are the ones left paying the price. Students say they only discuss lessons among themselves. Their parents worry the children won't learn enough to pass their exams. I just wish the government can negotiate with the teachers so that our children can learn. I want them to look after us in the future. Zimbabwe's government has threatened to replace defiant teachers like Masiwa if they don't soon return to the classrooms. Columbus Mavungab for viewing news Harare. All right, Maria Zimbabwe, shout out to uh, Columbus Mavunga, VOA correspondent in Zimbabwe, who was basically speaking to some of the teachers and also highlighting uh, what government is saying in terms of how they can, uh, what they're willing to manage. Uh, you heard there, uh, he was highlighting that government says, you know what, we can only afford 100 US and 75, of course, as the uh, PPE and COVID allowance that comes down to 175, but what I is why to more than 580, more than above 500 dollars. Let's head over to an interview that I had with one of the educators who basically explains as to why uh, they are really pleading incapacitation and of course what this all means uh, to her. Uh, we uh, reached out to Melissa Chumanangwana, who is an educator in Zimbabwe. Let's hear what Melissa I had to say. When you mention our salary as 45 US dollars, it sounds as if we get 45 US dollars hard cash, which is not the case. We actually get our money through our bank accounts and in order to access that money, you have to either use it through eco cash or you swipe 
or you go and withdraw from the bank, which is very difficult considering that you have to stand for hours and hours in a queue just to get a measly 500 in cash, which uh, by the time you get home, you would have used half of that on transport alone. Our money is actually given to us in bond. I personally get 3,600 in my account at the end of the month. And from 3,600, I have to buy milli meal. So in order to get milli meal, 10 kgs, I have to use 500 bond. In order to get uh, two liters cooking oil, I have to use 300 bond. And then if I want to buy uh, sugar, I pay 200 and something uh, bond which is almost 300 bond in order to get groceries that last for a month it means i have to use more than 3600 and that is just groceries alone before i even talk about water bills and electricity bills and most people are using prepaid electricity which you which uh, as you know the rates went up how does a teacher survive on 3600 where they have to pay for electricity water rent and also buy food from that money how do you feel about government's attempts to negotiate with educators to ensure that all are able to go back to school um this of course is following the money given last week and the meetings that government is having with teachers unions do you feel as though that there's promise that your demands will be met okay negotiations have been done so many times i think that avenue has been abused by our employers that has been used as a tactic of getting us to go back to work of making us think that things are now getting back on track or making us think that something will come out of it but uh, I'm, I'm, i know i speak for a lot of teachers when i say that um, negotiations are just a waste of time because i'm sure by now they know how bad things are we've been talking about this for the longest time and uh, anyone living in zimbabwe knows that Anyone who gets a salary of 3,600 is certainly finding it hard to survive in this difficult time. So negotiations really, I feel, are a waste of time. The employer knows our plight. And at this point, the best thing is to give us what we need. Now, Melissa, the examination dates are getting closer by the day. Teachers are still not in schools, meaning students are not preparing appropriately for these examinations. We have heard some experts and fellow educators propose that examinations be moved to 2021 because they feel as though uh, after everything that has happened in 2020, ranging from the closing of schools uh, through to teachers currently striking, students are not going to be well prepared uh, for these examinations. As an educator, what is your opinion on this? Opening schools was definitely not a good idea considering the amount of teaching and learning time that that has been lost since we closed schools in March. And even before that, uh, teachers had already declared incapacitation and there wasn't much teaching and learning taking place. So the whole of the 2020 academic year has been lost. And to open schools on the 28th and expect exams to be written starting from the 1st of December is suicide, really, because there are a lot of things, a lot of factors that needed to be considered first before uh, allowing uh, children to go back to school. So uh, unions have, have made recommendations. The first thing that has been recommended, the best thing to do right now is to close schools. After closing schools, the next step would be to have genuine negotiations with unions over the issue of teacher salaries. And then thirdly, examinations should be pushed to 2021 uh, so as to allow uh, learners enough time to prepare for examination and also ask teachers to prepare and give our learners what they need in order to write exams. And then also the government should appoint a task force to to, to look into the safety of schools. I mean, we're living in the COVID-19 era right now, and it's something that has to be done before we can just dive in back into the school environment. Every school, even the most remote school in the rural areas, do they have enough PPEs? Do they have enough infrastructure to practice social distancing? How are the risks being reduced in this COVID-19 era? That all has to be looked at. Now, government time and time again has highlighted that they're incapable of paying civil servants uh, in U.S. dollars because they do not print the money. Uh, If government cannot give in to those demands that you're asking for to be paid for uh, in U.S. dollars, is there anything else that can be done to get you as an educator to return to the classroom? If the government cannot give us 
hard cash of 520 US dollars, I mean, it would only be fair if we were given the equivalent of that in local currency and it should be calculated according to prevailing rates. That would be fair. As we wrap up our conversation, what parting words do you have for students and parents that are all feeling anxious right now because of the teacher strike and the approaching examination dates? To uh, the students and parents, um, This is our fight. We need to help one another. We are all affected one way or the other. As teachers, we're also parents and we would love for things to be normal and for us to be back in the classroom and doing our job because we love our job. We would love to be in the classroom right now and doing everything that we can to help our children to pass and go to the next level. But at this point, we need to help one another and work together and come up with a lasting solution. We need as much support as we can from the parents and from the students so that we can all be happy at the end of the day. All right, Maria Zimbabwe, shout out to Melissa Chumanangwana for joining us here, giving us a little more in-depth understanding as to why uh, they as educators are choosing not to go to school. We are showing them Belu Melissa, we are twice to at least that 3,000 bond and just for her to get by it costs way above three thousand. So we are showing people would see hi I'm Jabalisi and I'm doing Bali is you would see yeah now three thousand water would I will tell you my young corner a bang by the time she returns home would ask now I say open it's open uh I'm a bills are okay for example we are showing a thing I'm a grocer and she also pays for electricity and so forth before she has she's done even anything else with it Tashika kuma kumo echongwa chelucha nasi morie Zimbabwe chilota uchenda munu wese apinda mchilongwa chelucha nasi nasi mchilongwa chaka chichipata nyaezo chilore che coronavirus focusing on the girl child tichuona uka kutichilore che coronavirus chakanga nisa sei upeyu uweba naskana pangwichete nera nukazi tazea oje kare kukosha nyae kukosha kwe kusimu ziwa kwe wanukazi pangwichete nera naskana munyika tika kuma uka ne ukurukuru nemura iriti mugurushare meri sachi mwana mwana achiti batira wa achiti nzi upauru ziwa rujindi kuti chii chirumi ya tuita kufara iriti wako nungune chii chirumi ya tuita kufara iriti wati bodo avaswenda kushkoro we've come to an end to our program muri ya zimbabwe unfortunately my time here is up nonetheless uh, you can meet me on social media on twitter at big mike 3 b-i-g-m-y-k-e-3 uh, that is Twitter and Instagram. Let's meet same time, same place. Pano Pachirongwa Chelichewe Chitiki Mwine Ni Maikowe Ano Kone Kaini Mfaro Jini Wanyua Maikowe Muri Zimbabwe Chagazo Mwine Bye-bye!